हमने कुरान को समझने के लिए आसान कर दिया है तो कोई है कि सोचो सब And I'm going to start off by um, asking Tari Tayyip to um, give us a recitation of part of the Quran, and then we'll move on to the main program. Um, <coughs> oh, you want to take it? Professor Kashid Ahmed, 
uh, who has given up some time, inshallah, to uh, give us some advice and teaching, inshallah. So I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Zayd Barbez, uh, Vice President of the ISB nationally, who will give an introduction to Professor Kashid, um, and then we can move on to the question and answer section. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. My respected elders, my teachers, brothers and sisters, first of all I would like to thank Brother Dr. Hanif, Muhammad Hanif, for organizing this program on very short notice and the ISP Birmingham branch. I would also like to thank all of you for coming to this program, which I feel is a very unique program. Just to let everybody know who's here, we've got UK Islamic Mission members from the various centers, from Spark Group, Bigam Islam, Alam Rock, and from Hansworth here. Do they want to put up their hands, UK Islamic Mission members? Yes, UK Islamic Mission members. We've also got UK Islamic Mission member from uh, Leicester, Brother Fiazuddin, and uh, UK Islamic Mission members from Warsaw are also expected to, uh, to attend this program. We've got ISB members from Birmingham, Wolverhampton, and uh, we've got Rabita, our sister organization. Uh, they are also here, the representatives. Dr. Kamal Halbawi, who's the president of Rabita, he really wanted to come to this, pro this program. Unfortunately, he had to go abroad. He's given us some advice on what questions we should focus on. And we've got the young Muslim members here. We've also got representatives from the Amana Center, um, Spark for Brother Adnan is here. And um, we, uh, Islamic Relief uh, members are also expected to be <coughs> And young Muslims are mentioned, yes. Is there anyone else I've missed out? Okay. So the idea was to get a few members from all of our sister organizations here at this program. And uh, as you have gathered from our letter of invitation, that we are trying to organize a series of programs with our key, with the key personalities of the Islamic movement. We held our first program with Maulana Munawbar Hussain Mashadi in Wolverhampton. He was uh, my first teacher and we learned from him for five, six years. He went through the whole of the Quran, week by week, Tarsi Quran and Ahadith and he taught us the basic Islam and brought us into the Islamic movement. So in Wolverhampton, we held a program where we looked at his work and experience. We found it very, very inspiring. And uh, this program is with Professor Kushid Ahmed. I will introduce him in a minute. And the next program we have planned is with Professor Salim al Hasni in Manchester. And the one after that is with Dr. Kamal Halbawi in London. And like, uh, I don't know if you've been watching, you've been framed. The next, uh, you never know that the star of the show could be one of you next time, inshallah. Um, Professor uh, Koshid Ahmed, I think most of us know uh, his background and his contribution to the Islamic movement. He's not only a national figure, but he's also an international figure in the Islamic movement. He's a thinker, an intellectual, a writer, economist, established a number of institutions, and also Islamic organizations in a number of countries in Europe, America, and, and Africa. What I will do, I will introduce, give an overview some f key facts and figures very briefly. I managed to get his introduction from one of the books. There's about 25 pages and I summarized it into one page. And also after talking to key people who know Professor Kushid Ahmed uh, from the Islamic Foundation. So what I'm gonna uh, uh, present before you is just a very brief summary. The person who wrote an introduction to P Professor Kushid Ahmed was uh, a, a, a Professor S. S Esposito. Esposito. He's a professor at Oxford University and uh, he's written an introduction to Professor Kushid Ahmed. So I've got it, so the details are from there. Professor Kushid Ahmed was born in Delhi for the elders, New Delhi for the, uh, for the young brothers and sisters, in India in 1932. So he's about 65 years of age, 66 years of age now. His father's name was Nazir Ahmed who was a well-to-do businessman and also a friend of Marana Abu Laga Madhudi Rahmatullah Professor Kushid Ahmed was elected as the president of the Children's League at the age of 14 in 1946. 
1948, after the partition between India and Pakistan, his family uh, moved, emigrated to West Pakistan, first to Lahore for a few months, and then they settled in Karachi. In 1945, Professor Kashid wrote his first article on the Pakistan's budget, which was published in The Muslim Economist. After going through the basic education at school, Professor Kashid went on to further education at the government college in Karachi. And going to that college was a, so it turned out to be a turning point in his life. At the college, by, being with the, by having a close association with his elder brother, Zamir, together with Zafar Ishaq Ansari, and uh, our respected elder Khurram Murad, may Allah have mercy on him. Professor Kushid Ahmed became active in the work of the Jamiyat al tulaba which is the student wing of this Islamic movement, of, of Jamaat Islami. And by being involved in the Jamiyat, this determined the future course of his life. He became absorbed in the Islamic movement. In 1949, he officially became a member of the Jamiyat, and in 1950, he was elected as the as the, you can say, president of the Karachi branch of the Jamiyat. And between 1953 and 55, for two years, he served as the national president of all Pakistan, national president of the, of the Jamiyat. Now, as regards his educational qualifications, in 1953, Professor Kushid Ahmed obtained a first class BA degree in commerce. In 1955, two years after, he obtained an MA in economics. In 1958, he obtained a first class LLB degree. And finally, in 1964, he did another master's degree in Islamic studies. In 1956, Professor, Prof Professor Kushid Ahmed, he joined the jamaat e islami as a full member in 1956. And during his Jamiat and early Jamaat years, he was also an editor of a number of magazines and journals, not just one, but a number. For example, The Student Voice, from 52 to 55. A magazine or journal called The New Era, from 55 to 56. A magazine called The Voice of Islam, from 57 up to 1964. And Chirage Ra, from 1957 to 68. And he was also an associate editor of the Iqbal Review, from 1960 to 64. From 1955 onwards, Professor Kushid Ahmed, he taught economics in the Faculty of Economics and Commerce at the Urdu College and also in the Department of Economics at Karachi University. During the same time, while he was teaching at the college and the university, he was also actively involved in the work of the Jamaat. And in due course, he was given the responsibility to head the Foreign Relations Department of the Jamaat. And during General Ayub's time, who was a dictator, military general, uh, Professor Kushid Ahmed, amongst other Jamaat members, were arrested and put into prison for a short while because of their activities. In 1968, Professor Kushid Ahmed moved to the UK in 1968. Here he contributed a great deal in Islamic work in Europe and America. He served on the executive of the Islamic Council of Europe, I mean, if you remember in, 1960, in 1976, Islamic Council of Europe did a very big function in the Royal Albert Hall, where Maulana Abu Ramadudi Rahmatullah came, and also Muhammad Qutub and leading personalities of the movement. He was also involved in interfaith dialogue and Christian-Muslim relations, and he was a research scholar at the University of Leicester from 69 to 1972. He also established the Islamic Foundation in 1973. The contributions of Professor Kushid Ahmed to the efforts of the Islamic movement are really tremendous. He, he has authored and edited over 28 books in English, written 23 books in Urdu, translated and edited uh, 10 works of Maulana Abu Ramadudi, and authored many chapters and articles in numerous journals and books. He has often averaged between three to six months a year lecturing at universities, participating in international conferences and dialogues, speaking to Muslim audiences and helping Muslims in Europe, Africa, Asia and America to organize their organizations and communities. He, also, he has also been an excellent, in fact I would say a very valuable source of inspiration and guide for us in the Young Muslims and in the ISP. I remember once in the early days of Young Muslim, <coughs> Professor Kushid Ahmed and Brother Khurum, uh, Khurum Rad, they spent seven hours with us 
not lecturing but question answers and helping us in you know, order to see how we can plan and work more effectively in our work. The offices, when I looked at his CV, which I managed to get from Brother Sadiq from Islamic Foundation, it was really a very long CV, so I could not summarize you know, some of the things. The offices he has held at the national and international level are too numerous to mention in this short, short introduction. Most significantly, he has served as the cabinet minister in the General Ziaus Haq in 1978. And in 1979, he also established the policy study, uh, Institute of Policy Studies in Islamabad 1979. And last but not least, Professor Kushid's intellectual contribution to the Islamic movement in general, but Islamic economics in particular, is also significant. He was elected as the first president of the International Association of Islamic Economics that was founded in 1986. In 1988, he was awarded the first Islamic Development Bank Prize for, for his distinguished contribution to Islamic economics. And we'll get to find more about his contributions. In 1990, he was awarded the King Faisal Award for his service to Islam. So this was a brief introduction to his life, his contributions, his work. What we will do to, uh, now is that there are a number of questions which we have prepared in order to cover and make the maximum use of this program. There's about 16 questions and different brothers and sisters have been asked to ask those questions. And then after that, if there is time, we will open it up to the floor so we can ask uh, uh, other, other questions. So this is how it will be conducted. It will be like the 10 o'clock news. There will be myself and Brother Hanif will be conducting this session and uh, we'll uh, introduce the person who's quest uh, questioning and then he'll ask the question. Professor Koshir Ahmed will then go through the question and then we'll take the second question so on. And after this uh, part of the session is over, we have a few more things which we'll cover at the end. Okay, the first question which uh, we have is from Brother Tariq, Muhammad Tariq from uh, Birmingham. He's a driving instructor and he's also General Secretary of the ISB in Birmingham and is the Managing Editor of the Forum Magazine. Of the Forum Magazine, I'm sure most of you have seen this. So, Brother Tarek, he will ask the first question. Salam, Professor Rashid, my dear respected brothers and sisters, My question is, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your background, especially your parents and your family, and also your country of origin? <laughs> I am grateful to all of you, and particularly ISB, for giving me this opportunity to spend this evening and share some of my experience with you. Not because I am very important, but because we all are involved in a movement and as such sharing of experiences, sharing of ways and means through which different challenges have been faced is not merely a question of refreshing memory but of preparing ourselves to face the challenges in the future. Particularly for my younger brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, and we are thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for enabling us to grow, <laughs> to live, and to grow, get old under the wings of the Islamic movement. <coughs> that has been the greatest blessing. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. But now, it is you who have to shoulder this responsibility. Good or bad, we have lived our time. And our only prayer is that may Allah enable us to continue this effort till we breathe our last. 
ಪುರಾತಮತುಲ್ಲ ಪಂತು ಮುಸ್ಲಿಮ್ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ಪಿರಿಟ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ರೆಸ್ಪಾಂಡೆಡ್ ಯು ರಿಕ್ವೆಸ್ಟ್ ಫಾರ್ ಬ್ರದರ್ ಪ್ರವೇಶ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಐ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆಲ್ಲಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ಮೈ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಟೂ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ಸ್ ಮೀಟ್ ಮೈ ಫಾದರ್ ಕೇಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಪಂಜಾಬ್ ಮೈ ಮದರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಡೆಲ್ಲಿ ಬಟ್ ಶಿ ವಾಸ್ ಡಾಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಸನ್ ಆಫ್ ಟರ್ಕಿಶ್ ಅಂಬಾಸಿಡರ್ ಟು ಇಂಡಿಯಾ so that is how my great grand father maternal represented the ottomans in this opportunity and that gave me an opportunity to imbibe some of the traditions in which the muslims lived and breathed in Delhi, which had been seat of Muslim power for about 800 years. My education had been the normal education. I had my first exposure in a primary school, then a secondary school, both public schools of the mainstream, not for the elite. Although my mother was educated from one of the English medium elite institutions of that time. But my education had been in the ordinary school. And then I moved to Anglo-Arabic school, which represented the Muslim effort towards integrating modern education with some aspects of Muslim culture and tradition. But my home environment was one which had been perhaps the greatest influence on me, my mother, my father, both were highly educated. Although my father was a businessman, but he was educated in Aligarh Muslim University and had played a very active part in national politics. Mawana Muhammad Ali Zohar, Abul Kalam Azad, Mawana Shafat Ali, Mawana Mawdudi, they were his personal friends. And Mawana Shafat Ali, I met in my own house. Mawana Mawdudi, I met in my own house as a young boy. all these were household names for us and my mother's main concern had been not merely educating me but also initiating me into islam so my first lessons in my faith in my culture in my tradition had been from my parents and the climate of my home. And I regret it because in my view home is the place setter. Mother's lap, mother's training, the climate in which a boy or a girl attains his or her consciousness, that is the most crucial influence in one's life. Again, I am emphasizing it because those who are living in this part of the world, where family is disintegrating and it's become a kind of a parking place where you park your car for a while and then move out. Not the credit in which you live, you breathe, you learn, you grow, you become what you want. (coughs) 
our second question is from Brother Mazar Hussain. Uh, he's a student at Al Hijra School and he just got his GCSE results. He's got six A's and three B's. Very good, Brother Mazar. Allah Akbar. Congratulations. Mazar. Rahman Rahim. Brothers and sisters of Islam, my respected guests, Assalamu alaikum. I would like to ask Professor Rashid Ahmed if you could tell us something about his early years, uh, especially something about the games he's played, his interests, his hobbies, the books, he, the types of books he read, and the problems he encountered. The books that we played were somewhat Martian games. We were living in Delhi, where Muslims were in a minority and where Hindu-Muslim communal rights had raised their ugly head. And as such, the first concern of my family was that all members of the family, men and women, girls, boys, should have some training. So wrestling, exercises, unarmed combat, Lati. The stick. The stick. Not hockey, but <laughs> we, we had a special type of culture for that, the bidon, <laughs> which we used to learn. These were the things that we learned at a very early stage. Then naturally we were also sucked into the traditional games of football, cricket. Both of these I have played up to my metric. Also, badminton, ring, these used to play indoor games. I also learned to play chess and cards, that was also part of the culture. There was something known as bat bazi, that is competition in reciting couplets, share, and responding to that. There was a particular way of playing that game. It was a game, but it was also an educational process. I was very outstanding in that. And I think I remember something about 5,000 uh, ashar in my early primary and uh, secondary age. And I had always been in the winning team till I left Delhi. We also had very useful and very effective group activities. My first recollection is that of Bacho Ki Anjuma, the Students Association, Children's Association. At the age of uh, four or five, we would start that activity some games, some debates, some jokes, some outings, some scout activities, and Jamia Millia, which was a great Muslim institution, they used to organize annual programs in respect of these children's groups and organizations. Every year they used to have a Muhammad Ali trophy, again, after the name of Muhammad Ali the great Mr. Beer. I was the youngest president of Bachok and Juan who participated in that. And my first participation was just reading a poem. And Dr. Zakir Hussain personally kissed me and embraced me and gave me a prize on reciting that poem there. So that was the kind of climate in which we grew. Then, of course, Muslim League, my father was uh, active in Muslim League. He was uh, a member of the Council of the Muslim League. And uh, he represented Muslim League even in the uh, National All, All India Muslim League. The council that passed the resolution of Pakistan in June 47, he was a member of that. So he was very active in all this week. So because of that, political discussion, political activity, it was part of our life. So sports, this cultural activity, about books, oh yes, 
reading books became my passion from my very early age. And believe me, I've read all types of things, good, bad, rubbish. And I think everything has contributed something in giving me the mental culture and the capacity to learn from the sources. Of course, in the later stage, I was able to be more discreet, more choosy. But uh, I think reading culture had been part of our life from the time I can recollect. I think there should be enough. The next question is from uh, Brother Asif Suleiman, who is a member of the ISP and is accountant by trade. Um, I'd like to apologize on behalf of Brother Asif. He's had to leave. Uh, something important came up. But if I can welcome you, Professor Kashid Ahmed, on behalf of Brother Asif. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. If I may ask his question, is that okay? Yes. Um, basically, he, he wanted to know, after your um, emigration, from India to Pakistan, what sort of difficulties you faced there, how you had to adapt um, the society of that time, basically what you know. Young student, school student, I was very active, both in my studies, alhamdulillah from my fifth class till my master's I had always attained first position. But along with that, I was very active in cultural activities, in political activities, and particularly 1946-47, when the Pakistan movement was at its height. We were very active. And being at that time in the Anglo-Arabic school, at the very gate, which was at the vanguard of the youth struggle towards Pakistan. Agitations, processions, almost once or twice a week, going to Indian Assembly, cantonment, raising slogans and... So it has been a very multi-dimensional and very active political life. We were in elections in 1946 and were successful along the line. So in that context, when Pakistan was established, we had no other ambition but to go to Pakistan. But unfortunately, <coughs> this period was also a period of communal rights, <coughs> bloodshed, insecurity, confrontation. Alhamdulillah, I was uh, in a family that was well off, and as such, ordinarily, we had not had suffered the pangs of hunger or deprivation. But all of a sudden, because of these communal rights, the scenario changed. It was 3rd of September, 1947 when we had to leave our bungalow in Khalal Bagh, almost in our clothes. So much so that my elder brother had gone to his school and he was not in a position to return back to our house to go to the village of Huge where we were moving. After that we had to move to the refugee camp. It was uh, Humayun's castle <coughs> where several thousand people had to come and live for about five weeks in orderly tents with no other facilities, even toilet facilities. And from there, most of the people were going to Pakistan in trains. But trains were being sorted, 
and those who could afford, they tried to go by air. So half of my family moved to Pakistan in December 47, and I, my father, and my mother stayed back, and we moved on 12th of February 1948. That was my first experience of traveling by Dakota. Now you have jet and uh, supersonic concords, but at that time we had small Dakota in which we flew. So that was my <coughs> an experience I can never forget, where we had seen the human beings behaving worse than beasts. The charged spell of human body used to come. We had to make a totally fresh start up. Then we came to Lahore, stayed there for a few months, finally moved to Karachi, where we settled. The point view of interest to you that although I had seen Manana Madhuji in my house when I was 10 or 11 <coughs> during the war when he came to Delhi and he visited our house. But the real recollection, and I can recollect his dress, the way he said, he talked, but not what he talked. But when we moved to Delhi, to Lahore, then he was kind enough to visit our family and we prayed together in Maghrib and uh, he discussed many things with my father. I was also simply listening, but that I regretfully. And after that, then of course, when I joined Jamiat, <coughs> I was able to see him and he was really overjoyed that uh, his friend's son had chosen to follow and participate in the movement which he did. So that whole thing I've seen with their own eyes, I have been a participant in that situation. And that really made me conscious of the evil and the extent to which evil can overwhelm human beings and what consequences are produced because of that. So that has been a very shattering, yet a very a, an experience that teaches one to face reality, to face facts, and be prepared to be confronted with the worst. So that had been something that I have not because of that. Okay, our next uh, question from Brother Tanvir. Brother Tanvir, he's um, come back to Birmingham after his studies uh, at Huddersfield and he just graduated. He's an ISP member. He became, he started to join the work of the ISP and young Muslims from the university where Brother Manir was standing there with distributing leaflets and he joined the work at that time. Brother Tanvir. Assalamu I'd just like to know, uh, <coughs> was there any particular event or personality that uh, motivated you to join this argument? And what was the attitude of the general public uh, towards him at that time? <coughs> Well, as I just told you, Alhamdulillah, any, my faith and my initiation into Islam, that has been in my family. And the network of cultural <coughs> and social and religious activities in which I was involved from my very early days. Praying, fasting, reading the Quran, Muslim history, having as a, a 
our heroes whom one would like to emulate. That framework was very much there. But when I moved to Lahore and Karachi, that was, and my age at that time was 16, 17, 18, this is the age. And somehow you see in my family also English language was rather more popular. Although I had my grooming in uh, Urdu and Persian and Arabic, but somehow English books, English literature, English journals, they used to come. English films. <coughs> I also had a ambition to become a good writer. And particularly writing in English. And whatever I used to write in my school days, my teachers were very happy about that. That gave me a lot of encouragement also. It was in this context that I discovered M. L. Roy, Jawaharlal Nehru. His autobiography I read at the age of uh, 16. Glimpses of history, letters of my father to his daughter, which he wrote to Indira Gandhi for his prison. <coughs> Even Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Shaw, C.D.F. George, and Jewels, I had started reading at that age. And with this reading, the ideas on which these scholars and these writers, they have emphasized, they started influencing me. And somehow, nationalism and socialism, these two began to become important in my way of thinking. And when I was in Lahore, one of my class fellows, who is now a leading socialist, Dr. Iqbal Ahmed, we were class fellows and very friendly. And he writes, E. Iqbal. So we were once discussing that uh, what is our future? We were not clear. But both of us were saying that we have to read communism more thoroughly. Socialism, and also Marala Madhuri, Jamaishad, to make up our mind. So I was on the crossroads. It was during this period that I started even writing, and uh, my first article was published in Mr. Economist in 1949, when I was <coughs> studying in my second year. The Dawn published my articles, even a paragraph before their editorial, and I was a student. So it was that situation in which I was groping and trying to discover something. At that critical moment, I moved to Karachi, and my elder brother, Amazon, Amazon had already joined Jamiyat. And he was the first person who gave to me one of these books. And I remember vividly that the two books that I read first were Khutbat and Tanqihat. Khutbat you have read in English, Let Us Be Muslims. It's a very simple book, very moving book. And in Urdu, in his own style, if you have been praying and fasting, it is by reading this book where you discover what their real meaning is. What you are doing as habit. Through this I discovered its meaning and significance. So that moved me. And I don't know how many times I read it. Tanuki Hat was his collection of articles 
primarily deal with the challenge of Western civilization and Islamic response to that and his critique on Western civilization. So the cobwebs that I had built in my immature mind by reading these Western and Hindu thinkers, they were smashed. It was also my passion for English language that I read another book by Asad, Islam at the Crossroads, almost at the same time. Iqbal had been a household person for us and our mental upbringing had been on the verse of Iqbal, not his philosophy writings that I had not read at that time. Only Bani Daras, Bani Jibreel, Zarabe Kaleem, these were the three on which we were fed and nurtured. So it was there as an emotion, as an anchor, but not as a conscious intellectual <coughs> decision. So I think Iqbal, Murana Madhuji, these works, and Asad were the main intellectual influences which not only enabled me to make my decision but set the course for my future life and career. But I would be unfair if I don't mention that it has not been merely the family background and the influence, these intellectual influences, these dowry personalities, but also something very unique and distinct. And that's why I would not say any particular event. It is all these three or four influences together. And that final thing was the love, the affection, the magnetism which I found in the brothers who were leading Jamiyat. Perhaps you do not know, but in our times, one of the traditions was that when a boy joins the college, there was first year fully. And the idea was to tease him to beat. So that they are disciplined and accept the leadership of those who are already there. So in that climate, I found Jamiyat brothers a very different uh, quantity. Affection, the, a kind of gravitational pull, taking interest in you, not criticizing you, not uh, bulldozing you, not forcing anything upon you, not even the good things. So it was a very different climate. And this climate sucked me in. I thought it could not be otherwise. So it was this feeling of ahuwa, of partnership. It was not the intellectual capabilities of the colleagues. They were great intellectuals also. But it was their affection and love. It was their kindness and brotherhood where that influenced And if somebody says that, can I draw a line and say that was the thing, or that was the time when I entered? No, I could not. It was a kind of a magnetism that when I really opened my eyes, I was inside. So this is how I came into the movement. And then I found out this generosity and this uh, selflessness that I was a very newcomer. A bit arrogant also. But uh, they welcomed me, they embraced me, they honored me. Within two months of my becoming Rukun, I was elected the Nazim of Karachi. Within the first year, I was elected Nazim of Holsin, or Promise. 
I was given position responsibility. In 1953, I became Nazibar. And at that time, I didn't have my beard. And there were certain brothers who were uncomfortable of that. I remember that one, you know, on the picnics, some of them refused to pray behind me. Although I was elected there, Nazim, they said they didn't have beard, they would not pray behind me. I didn't mind, but of course they made this point. It was only in my second year of Nizam al that I grew a So, accepting me, giving me opportunities, giving me respect, giving me opportunities, I think all these have contributed immensely in making me what I became. I think that covers the major part of Shirk one can just speak hours of that. The next question is from Brother Shahid, who works as an ophthalmic optician in Wolverhampton. He's a member of the ISP in Wolverhampton and is also taking part in the Muslim Funeral Committee and the ISP Educational Program. Brother Shahid. Assalamu I think you've already answered part of my question. Uh, the rest of it is, um, what were your experiences and challenges uh, with the Jumit Tulubar, both as uh, a member and as a president? First of all, let me make it very clear, and I think this is a blessing of the movement, that looking back to these 50 years, I have never felt that this is what I did. I was that's what we did. So everything has been a team a joint effort. And it's very interesting that when I joined Jamiat, Khurram was Nazim. Within six months I was Nazim, and he was just not a member. In the next all Pakistan elections he was elected as a Bihala. For one year, I was Azimala. After one year, I was Azimala. So we all had to be interacting, supporting each other, strengthening each other. Shura had been very active. There has been decision making with consultation. But coming to the challenges, let me tell you, perhaps you might have experienced it here. But believe me, in Pakistan also, in the 1940s and 50s, the climate in educational institutions was purely secular and peaceful. If you have a beer, you are backward and aggressive. To be progressive was something everybody was would like to be. There were no facilities for Zor or Asr prayers in colleges. If you have to pray, then you may pray in some secluded, abundant quarter. Jamiyat started taking interest in these things. And in all the colleges of Karachi, there was only one college, Urdu College, that allowed us to have a room for prayer. And it was on the mat that we used to have our meetings. Otherwise, we would meet in some park outside. Aramba was the place where we used to meet. Or in that room in Urdu College. No other place we could hold our meetings. In those days, in Jamiyat, we had started a very systematic program in the form of not only personal reading, but study circles. We had a smaller group would 
study, would discuss, somebody would make presentation, like Usra of the Quran. And in this respect we had two very good teachers in Karachi, Professor Jalaluddin Ahmed and Maulana Yahya Nadvi. They were a great influence on us. And from Bihwan we had brother Sayyid Ramadan, who was personal assistant to Imam Hazraman Shahid and also who became his son-in-law. Sayyid was with us for several years because he came to Pakistan to participate in a conference and while he was here, the Nukrasi Pasha killing took place in Egypt. Ikhwan were banned, he could not go back, so he stayed with us. So that's how these three brothers did help us a lot in understanding things and in developing the institution and Tarbi Azam in the Jamaat. Now when I became Nazim of Karachi, I remember clearly my first challenge was how to re-enter the mainstream, how to get out of those backwaters and be in the mainstream of student life. So I went and met the principal of SM College and told him that we have equal right to hold our meetings in the college. Why are we realizing? Ghulam well, Mustafa Shah was the principal. Later on he became a very leading PPP, stalwart, and also a cabinet minister. But he was my teacher and he respected me and I respected him. For a moment he thought and then he said, yes, why not? So the literature hall in Assam College, we were able to have a weekly meeting for the first time. And that was a breakthrough. Then the students started getting attracted and interested in us. And then I tell you that we really worked very hard to present good programs. <coughs> Whole week we would make preparations because all these speeches were done, discussion were done by the students. But we tried to make it to a, at a level that we could attract. And we took up all the major issues, economic, political, educational, socialism, secularism, Darwinism. We reduced the study from encyclopedias and then come up with answers to face the questions that the students were asking. Then we thought that we should start our own magazine. So we produce a student's voice for full one year in cycle style form. We used to write, then some of us brothers used to type, then cycle style them, and then distribute that. Within one year we had such a such a response that we thought we should come out in print. So we came out in print in 1952. And it was a sellout. First the student's newspaper. The student's voice, the fourth title. I and Dr. Zavrasan Zadi were its editors, but we had a team who were helping us. But everything was done ourselves. Even selling it in their schools and colleges, on the occasion of any public function, we will do it ourselves. So that's how we tried to promote. <laughs> First issue we published 1,000, second 2,000, I think the tenth issue was 13,000. And this became a very historic issue because in that we had written an open letter to the Prime Minister, raising the question of what should be the future educational system and where you are taking us. And in the same week there was a clash between the students and the government. Tear gas, firing, it became a national issue. And that was how students' voice just broke that sound barrier. 
And it was on that occasion that the reader of Dawr al Hussain, he challenged. He said that I cannot believe that this is written by a student. <coughs> Dr. Manzoor Ahmed, who later became Vice Chancellor of the Andhra University, he was Nazim at that time. And he told him that if you want, we can invite that student to your room and he can write here. That was my first meeting with Al-Tahab <laughs> And then we became friends. Although, you see, he was critical of Jamaat. He became a cabinet minister later on in the new Khan's time. But he would come to my house to publish my article. And uh, he became a <coughs> This was the time when we met Mr. Brohi. In the third issue, Mr. Brohi at that time was the attorney general. Sorry, advocate general. And he had written an article. <coughs> that there is no constitution in the Qur'an. And he said that if anybody can prove that Islam, Qur'an gives a constitution, I'll give you 5,000 rupees. The 4,000 rupees at that time was a wee bit amount. <laughs> so I wrote an answer to that. Does Islam give a constitution? It was a real article in Stuart's Vice, issue 3. And then Rui asked me to go and meet him. I in the Rizat met him, and from that time we became friends. <laughs> Sir? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was childish. <laughs> and I remember that uh, that very time, roughly, his first book came, Ad Adventures in Self-Expression. So he wrote his presentation and gave a copy to me. So that's how, you see, we were able to make Challenges were coming and we were facing them. Then political issues, economic issues, constitutional future of the country. That is how we were able to bring Jamiyat into the mainstream. Then we, elect, we participated in the first elections in Urdu College. And we won both the presidentship and secretary election. That's how the door for active participation in student politics began. <laughs> Then, of course, we had this challenge of uh, Mashriqi Pakistan, East Pakistan, where we were very weak. So Jamia took an initiative, and we made it compulsory for all our Arkan to learn Bengali language, not to be obsessed in the language controversy. We have to learn the language of the people. We have to work among them in their lives. We have to suck them in. And we have to emerge as one Ummah, not Urdu speaking and West Pakistani or East Pakistan. All the initiatives were taken in those times. The constitution of Jamia, from when well, he was Nazim Allah, for the first time, proper constitution of Islamic Jamia was framed. Three member committee was responsible for that, for them, myself, and the Rizak himself. But we didn't do it just on our own. <coughs> We invited all the members to give their suggestions. We really worked very hard. Then we produced it. Then we circulated it. Got feedback. Then finalized it. Then Shura approved it. Then went to the Arkhan and got it approved. So that's how we see. We tried to... And that was the period, you see, which really made us what we are. Even in the Japan, even now, I feel that the basic influence, movement-wise, had been these four or five years of hard work in the Jamaat, from 1950 to 1956. I retired from Jamaat after completing my education in July 56, and immediately offered myself to Jamaat, and within two months I was approved as member of the Jamaat, although normally in Jamaat it takes very long to get the membership. Sorry. Our next question is from Brother Mahmoud Hussain. He's an ISP member. He's been working with us for the last 15 years. He's a solicitor by profession. He's working in Babylon. Mahmoud. Bismillah. Uh, uh, Professor Kashir, my question is that uh, you achieved very high grades, and of course you excelled in your studies. How did you achieve this uh, whilst at the same time being so heavily involved with the lot activities? First, I think it's a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really cannot claim any credit for that. Secondly, I think 
there has always been an ambition in the right sense to learn, to strive, to achieve. And I think this ambition and this achievement, sense of achievement, has been a motivating factor. Third, the climate, the tea, the environment in which I work. It had both appreciation and criticism. <coughs> but appreciation was also part of it. So when one feels what one is contributing, it also acts as a fertilizer. And fourth and finally, I think something that I learned the hard way, time management. How best one can use one's time. In fact, Time has immense potential and we do not know how much time we waste. You see, Imam Sarabanna Shaheed has very beautifully said, al waqtu huwa al Time is life. And Imam al Qayyim has very beautifully presented it, something that has always been a part of my soul and my thinking, you see, Mahabir Mahajam says that I understood the meaning of Walasr when I saw a person who was selling ice in the market and the ice was melting into water and he was making every effort to quickly sell it. Because I realized that if he fails to sell it quickly, all of the eyes would become water. So that is how time is melting. And we are not conscious of the importance of time. And once we realize time management, then we can really make use of our time in the best possible manner. <clears throat> and one thing that I learned from my early childhood had been a kind of a self-evaluation. See, my father and mother told me that when you go to your bed in the night, before you sleep and you make your dua, just spend two, three minutes on how you spent your day. What you did, what you didn't do. If you did any good thing, thank Allah for that. If you did any bad thing, seek forgiveness and then make a resolve that, inshallah, my tomorrow will be better. So this was what my mother taught me. This was what my father encouraged me to do. Initially, I didn't realize it's important. But as I grew, I realized how important it is and how this helps you in effective, optimal time management. So if you can manage your time properly, <coughs> you can achieve better. The next question is from Dr. Ahmed, who is a general medical practitioner in Birmingham and is a member of the ISP in Birmingham and is also involved in the Forum magazine. You have been editor of a number of magazines and Islamic journals. Can you please tell us something of their readership, circulation, and what objectives did you set out and what insight did you have on this? As a student, I think it was my third year in BA. In Pakistan, we had two years intermediate and two years in BA. It was third year, total college time, or first year of BA that we started. I think it was perhaps one of the most creative experiences. And what I learned was, it is only by facing difficulties that you die. Students' wise leadership initially was just students. But then we very soon realized that even teachers read it. 
general public took interest in that. Some of its issues were even read and referred to in the National Assembly of Pakistan. Mawala Madhudi used to read it and guide us, appreciate it. Internationally, some of my best friends, Hazrat Durabi, Jafar Shah Idris, Dr. Tanyab, Zawal Abidin, Dr. Hussain Al-Atas, from the nation. These were the persons who had read it, responded to us. In fact, in every issue we used to have half a page devoted to Islamic persons or groups working all over the world. And whatever response we were giving, we were giving it there. Would you believe that in the student's voice, if you go and look into the back files, you will find replies to my letters from Arnold IMP, Peter M. Sorokin. We wrote on these issues. We wrote to them also. They replied. Muhammad Hasan. Hasan was very happy with that. And Hasan uh, dedicated to me his book, Road to Mecca. And with the request that please review it in your paper. So it was not merely students. But definitely that was the main audience. New Era was there only for about uh, one year. After I left, my education became a lecturer. We realized that in English journalism, Islam was conspicuous by its absence. You would be amazed a conference of Jamaat which was one of the biggest in Karachi. The two national Urdu dailies, Jang and Anjam at that time, their brother line, main brother line was based on the speech Marana made in that conference. And English newspapers didn't mention even one word. As if the event has not taken place. Debate in the Constituent Assembly was taking place on the Constitution. And every day new issues were being raised. So it was in that context that the Amir Jamaat of Karachi, Sadhguru Allah Ahmad, he was a great influence in our lives. In fact, after Mawla Madhuri, I have learned most from him in Jamaat. So he asked me and Zafar Zak to be prepared to produce it. I was full-time working in a college. Zafar Zak working full-time. And with that, we had to produce this weekly. So we did produce it. But its target was mainly the political community, the parliament, the press. Unfortunately, we could not continue because of the financial problem. But one year, that uh, new era, it had its impact. And as I said, it was also quoted a number of times in the Constitutional Assembly. Then there was a change. I continued in my English journalism by becoming an editor of Voice of Islam and of Iqbal Review, because Iqbal had been a passion. So I was a straight editor. And I was doing almost 99% of the work. The full editor was just his name. And this continued till 1964 when we were arrested. After that, I had to discuss you with these because they were autonomous, non-Jamaat bodies. So, however, during this period, Sir so Ramamad asked me because Islamic law was a very burning issue at that time, and I had just done my LLB first position. So he said that why don't you produce a special issue of Charagara or Islamic law? I took it up as a challenge. This was my first venture in Urdu. And I was telling some of my brothers, the first editorial that I wrote in Urdu, I was really not confident. So I gave it to one of the leading poets, Mahalo Mahalo Khadri, 
to see and correct it if there is any mistake in that. But Alhamdulillah, that was a very important research work. The first volume was about 700 pages, second volume was under 600 pages, and these two volumes taken together are up till now regarded as a major contribution on Islamic law. So after that, that gave me some confidence. So then I was invited to become editor of Karagra, the and that I took up from 1958 and continued to 1968, ten years I That was for the educated people in Urdu, also for the movement to provide intellectual guidance. And the idea was, Shradara initially was a literary magazine, but I tried to make it a literary of intellectual and culture. Roughly, if you have seen on the pattern of encounter, Stephen Spender and Irving Crystal produced that. That was my model, by and large. And that we had maintained till 1968. Then I came here and played a very backdoor role in the production of impact. But Alhamdulillah, brother uh, Hashir Faruqi, one of the most talented that we have. He really provided a leadership to the impact. And I can say that this is perhaps one of the best English magazines Muslim has produced. So initially I was helping him, then later on he took it over himself. Now I have this responsibility for the development after Brother Khurram. I'm trying to keep the torch broadly this. Um, there's a, just a question that has arrived from one of the sisters. I think it would be a good break between them. Uh, the sister says, if you could tell, tell us about your married life. Um, how did your wife help you with the work which you're doing? And how much time do you spend with your family? <laughs> I married quite late. My mother, Ramallah, died in 1960. She was very eager to marry me, but I had always requested her to postpone. And she used to say that, okay, your first marriage with Jamaat, but we can have a second marriage. <laughs> But unfortunately, she could not marry in her own lifetime than my aunt Khala. She arranged my marriage in 1967. And in 1969, my wife joined me here in UK. One year we lived together in uh, Pakistan. I came here in uh, September 1968, and she joined me in uh, June 1969. Alhamdulillah, we have six children. Three boys and three girls. It's been quite productive. Alhamdulillah, our family life is very happy. We share the ideals, and she has been a source of strength. Because if I had not had her support, I would not have been able to do whatever little I was able to do. Particularly. The academic work, the dawa work, the traveling. Well, you have asked a personal question, so let me share with you that fourth, uh, seventh day after my marriage, I started writing the article on Islam and Socialism, 150 pages, and it took me 45 days to write that. And my wife didn't grudge. She realized that I have a life this time. And she really not only accepted it, but made it possible for me to continue it. Alhamdulillah, all my children have been groomed in Islamic tradition. Not only that, I would be very frank with you, I am a bit Call me extremist, 
But my effort was that my children should be able to speak Urdu in the proper Urdu dialect. So we tried to see that in the house we always speak Urdu. The children should be able to eloquently express themselves without the English slant. And then, of course, we educate their English also. They speak English better than myself. But Alhamdulillah, all the things you will not find an English shadow on their Urdu pronunciation. Similarly, about prayer and the family life. Two of my daughters of the law are married. The three sons are the eldest one is about to complete his education next month. Others are still studying. Uh, my eldest daughter is has very sharp intellectual capabilities. And my second boy has very sharp intellect. He has always been achieving distinctions and he will be working for his PhD. Others would be more practical and after their education would join me in my Islamic work as well as in my business and family business. <coughs> so I'm very happy. Um, the next question is from uh, Brother Khalid Akhtar, who's a civil engineer and is a member of the ISP in Mulmahant. I think maybe some of these questions have been covered also. Uh, but the question is, when did you join the Jamaat Islami and how serious was this organization taken at the time? And what was its membership and work at that time? I joined the Jamaat in October, and I joined, offered myself in July, July 1956. And in October 1956, I took my oath of membership. Immediately after that, I was elected to the Shura in Karachi. Within a month, I think. After two months, that is February 1957, Jamaat faced an internal crisis, which we know as Machihet event. And on that occasion, a Majlis of Shavarat was elected with the two persons from each constituting unit. It was about 30 percent of And I was amazed that from Karachi I was elected as one of the two who were elected to this Mashavrat. And when this Mashavrat met, I was asked to be its chairman. So I was overwhelmed by one of the greatest crises and challenges in my life, in a position of total unpreparedness. But Alhamdulillah, about ten days were involved in that. We were able to arrive at a consensus resolution about the program, a consensus resolution about the future constitutional structure of the Jamaat and distribution of power and responsibilities between different organs and different positions. And from then onwards, I have been in the Shura of the Jamaat, the Central Shura. Also, I was trusted almost from the very beginning with the writing of the resolutions of the Jamaat. Uri Dalia Mala Madhudi used to write personally. Then, Mala Madhudi was helped by Mawana Naim Siddiqui. I was the third person who was inducted in. And till 1968, most of the resolutions were drafted either by any of these three or by myself and Naim Siddiqui and corrected by Mawana Madhudi. And then, of course, after discussion, approved by the party. So policy planning became my main concern within Jamaat. 
Then for the first time in Jamaat, we introduced the concept of planning. So five-year plan we had introduced, and I was the chairman of the group that made that plan. In the 68, I moved to UK, went back in 1978. After that, again, I have been elected to the Jamashura, and then had been responsible for policy planning, the spokesman on economic issues, and foreign affairs. These have been three major assignments. For some time, I was responsible for youth <coughs> and students. Then Brother Khurram took it over. Then Brother Gunavar took it over. But the other three, I have held till two years back when I had this hard problem, after which I am in the committees, but no longer responsible for that. Okay. Next question is from Tariq Akhtar, who is an internal sales engineer. Uh, he's got a business degree from uh, Leicester and is an ISP member. He's in fact the president of ISP in Wolverhampton. Uh, a few in and out, so maybe we may have answered aspects of this question. Uh, what was your responsibility and experiences as a minister in uh, Zia ul Haq's government? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> So see, I was never expecting any position in the government. While I was in UK, my main assignment was development of the Foundation. Along with that, background support to UK Service Mission and impact. And to explore the possibilities of Dawa in Europe and America, and to help them, organize them, guide them, that was my dear assignment. However, these activities were reported to Jalal Zawarat. And perhaps, to the best of my knowledge, most influential had been Mr. Brody. He had been very close to Zawarat. And he was also very impressed by my work. And he persuaded Zia to invite me. I went there just to meet him. We had a very good discussion, three hours. He was kind enough to offer a dinner. And then all of a sudden he said, why don't you become my advisor? It was just unexpected and I was shocked with it. But I apologize. I said, no, it's not possible for me. I am neck deep in my work there in Leicester. I cannot come. And secondly, I am a member of the Jamaat. How can I join the moment? And it ended there. Then after two months, again, I was invited. Well, how you are seeing the economic situation? How do you advise? And we had fairly long distance time. And it ended at that. Third time, then Mr. Borui again telephoned to me that General Ziaullah is very eager to have you as his advisor. Please rethink. I again apologize that it's not possible. Then what happened was that during this period, PNA and General Ziaullah were in negotiations. And PNA agreed to join the cabinet. This was done on 21st of August 1978. What's PNA, sorry? Pakistan oh. National Alliance. It was the Pakistan National Alliance of nine parties which fought Bhutto, which was the main opposition party. <coughs> so General Zawada invited PNA to join the cabinet. And PNA agreed on certain terms. Those were written terms. Professor Kafur was the Secretary General of PNA. Mufti Mahmood was his president. So they negotiated the terms and they decided. And the cabinet was sworn in on 21st, in which Jamaat was given three seats. Professor Kafur, President Ahmed Elahi, and Mahmood Azul Farooqi. These three joined as Jamaat representatives. Five from Muslim League, 
two from Jamaat al Islam, from Jamaat al Pakistan, from PDP. These were the five parties that was represented in that. On 22nd, I received telephone from Jamaat al Islam, and he said that now. The PNA has joined the cabinet. You cannot have any excuse, and you must come and join us. I said all my prayers to the PNA has joined. We have completed the cabinet. It's all in. Let them work. I said no, you have to come. Then I said that no, I'm sorry, it's not possible for me. And also, unless the Jamaat asks me, how can I come? So then, in the evening, the telephone came that I have talked to Bala Madhudi and Mr. Khair Mohammed. They will also telephone to you, and you have to come. So then I went there, but frankly I didn't go there with the idea of accepting. So for three days we negotiated, 27th, 28th, 29th of August. And when Jamaat and Malam Mudhi said, then you should join, then I had to accept. But then it was my turn, and it's very important. I told him very frankly that I have no intention of joining, but if you want me to join, Then I have three conditions. First condition is you must know my thinking. This is my vision about economy, about development, about interest. And if you are prepared to cooperate with me and go on those lines, then I may join. Otherwise, not. Secondly, I said, you see, I was not taken as a political person. I was taken as a technocrat. So my basic position was to be deputy chairman of the planning commission. And this is a cabinet position in the status of Minister for State. M. M. Ahmed, Khurud, Rama, all of them had been in that position. So I told him that uh, I would be happy with Deputy Chair of the Planning Commission, but I cannot accept the status of Deputy Minister. If I have to come, I have to be at par with the Finance Minister, because Planning and Finance are the two major sources for policy making. If Planning is Has upper hand, then I don't think I would be able to win. So unless, for the first time in Pakistan history, deputy chairman was given the status of federal minister. And third, I said that I should have the right and discretion to build my team, both from bureaucracy and from economists and experts. When these three conditions were agreed, then I accepted that position. And it's very interesting that I joined. I attended the meeting of the cabinet before I took oath of a minister. I attended the meeting, and the next day I took oath as a minister. I found out that the whole bureaucracy has no vision of Islam. Even serious work, you would be shocked to know that the planning commission. Which was supposed to be the brain trust of the country had no plan for three years, five years, ten years. There were only two PhDs in the front team. When I visited their library, most of the books had not been used for several months, not even dusted. Some of the new books. Give you one example. Foreign remittances had become an important source of Pakistan's foreign exchange from 1972 to 1973. In 1978, not a single study had been made in the Planning Commission <coughs> on this issue. Was this was the situation in which I was. I had only eight months because from end August 1978 till April 1979. We were in cabinet, but we worked very hard. We tried to give a new vision of planning commission. For the first time, a new vision was given in which planning commission was to consist of not merely bureaucrats, but economists, representatives from every province, educationists, one alimadi, one representing industry. One representing labour, 
The system of 21 persons we created planning council. We were able to give a new economic program. We were able to develop the entire Islamic economizing package. Everything was done by the planning commission. The whole planning about elimination of riba, of zakat, of uh, new priorities of planning. Even the speeches of the president were prepared in the planning commission. So we had to work day and night. And I must say that Islamic Ideology Council, with uh, Justice Chima as its chairman at that time, they gave us full cooperation. They were just sidetracked. They were not a part of the system. The planning commission was the heart of the system. So I tried to block them in. And in fact, I recommended to Zia that Islamic uh, Ideology Council should be a part of the system, because they are operating outside the system. This is just a client. They can give their recommendations, that's fine. So I tried to integrate them. All the committees that I made, I had participation from them. Mawadzakhi Usmani was in almost three committees which worked on these subjects. I tried to bring in best economists from the country. When I left in eight months' time, <coughs> I had nine PhDs. I had reorganized the departments. I made well established economics as one of the major departments. And Dr. Fahim Ha was appointed its chairman, who is now in the Islamic Development Bank, and who was Director General of the International School of Islamic Economics when I was able to develop the International Islamic University Stavok. So in those eight months we were able to do that. Not only that, we were able to develop the whole new education policy. Although it came from the education department, but the whole draft was prepared by the planning commission. So that is how Alhamdulillah, we were able to. And just one final thing. In Pakistan's history, ministers have been welcomed when they take oath and are not even referred to when they leave. But we were the only four ministers from Jamaat when we resigned. Our departments wept and public functions were held in our honor. Almost all the staff participated. And the secretary of the planning commission, he said that this had been a very new experience for us. We had never had exposure to such persons. And when, of course, PNA resigned, because we were not driven out, we were dismissed, we had joined on the understanding that provincial governments would also be made <coughs> on the same pattern. A date for election would be fixed. And once the date of election is announced, we will contest the elections and not continue in order. So on 23rd of March, 1979, the new dates for election were announced and the whole Islamization package was announced. Immediately after that, we said we would like to resign. Zia said, no, hold on for a few weeks. Then on 21st of April, we resigned. Then Zia told me that you were not in PNA quota. And you are there as a technical grade, so please, you should not resign. And I said, there's no question. And I didn't take more than a split second. Once PNA is going, I have to go. So that's all. Sorry. The next question is from uh, Brother Nadeem Malik, who uh, works as a lawyer and is a member of the ISP in Birmingham. He's also vice chair of the Association of Muslim Lawyers. Uh, um, you told us about when you came here. Can you tell us a bit about why you came here? And since you've been here, how does the movement in this country compare to Pakistan? I see. Well, I think there are certain events. Originally, you see what happened was, that uh, General, Zia, General uh, President Ajit Khan was very unhappy with me. I must say that the level of the educationist institution in Pakistan in that time was very high. When I joined the university, there was Mashallah. It was in 1960 that I was appointed a senior lecturer in Karachi University. So Jamaat was banned. <coughs> now Jamaat was revived after the withdrawal of Mashallah in 1962. 
and my membership of Jamaat was restored. My membership of Shura of Jamaat was restored. My membership of the Amina of Jamaat was restored. <coughs> and the question came before the Vice Chancellor who was Dr. Dr. Parish that he is a member of the political party and have playing a leading role in that. <coughs> How can we have it? He said there is nothing in the rules which say that So the vice chancellor said that I cannot dismiss him. He will continue. And the director of education had to put it, put a put up with it. Interestingly enough, when 6th of January 1964 I was arrested, because the entire leadership of Jamaat was arrested, Jamaat was banned, Mala Madhudi and all his colleagues were arrested, so I was arrested from the university. And after that there was a strike in the university for two days. I was in prison for nine months and seven or eight days, for ten days, nine months and ten days. And we were released by an order of the court that our detention was illegal. Jamaat's banning was illegal. Jamaat was restored. And after Jamaat was restored, <coughs> our whole detention was declared to be illegal uh, have an issue from the beginning. So after that I came back to the university. And again, I was welcomed to the university. The whole university held a big reception in the auditorium. Now, throughout this period, the director of education, who was a member of the syndicate, was insisting that I should be dismissed. But the syndicate refused. They said, he has been politically detained. He has not been committed or convicted for any crime. We will not dismiss him. We will treat the nine months, ten days as leave without pay. And when I rejoined, the syndicate passed that this absence would not affect my seniority in employment. So this was the stature of people at that time. Not the psychophone that we have now. Now after two years, General Ziaullah was very, the, the Ayub Khan was very unhappy. Because I had also produced Nazariya Pakistan number, which was banned. The Chief Commissioner of uh, Karachi at that time was uh, Masood Masar uh, He ignored the instructions of the Ministry of Interior and restored that. And I restarted it. So he was very attacked. So he was Professor Shah was Education Secretary. And he gave this message to me and to Tajabala Mohammed <laughs> that we are very uncomfortable. We don't want more confrontation. Would it be better? if Professor Khurshid would go out for higher studies. So that's how I was going out to America. I was I had admission in Tuck University, Harvard, to work for my PhD. But that was the time when Mawla Madhudi was ill, and he had to undergo two operations. And I, I came with him. So I came here on the 6th of September, 1968. And February, I was with Mawla Madhudi through his, 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 his two operations. During this period, Bala said that you change your program. Don't go to America, stay here. It was during this period that we thought of the whole idea of Islamic Foundation, of impact, the work in Europe, having a place where the movement thought could be projected at the world level. So I had to change all my program. Then I stayed here. You 
Western University at the Hinge, where I worked for three years as a scholar. But all of my time was devoted to these activities. And then when the foundation was established, I was his first director general. Continued to 1968. That's all. So it has been an accident. Okay, brothers, we got a number of questions at that. This, we haven't even come to Britain yet. Would it be okay if after Maghrib prayer, because we were planning to finish by Maghrib, because we started half an hour late, is it okay if after Maghrib we come here immediately, we carry on with this program for another half an hour, and then there is dinner organized? Is that okay with everyone? Okay, so we'll go for Maghrib and then come back. Sorry, there was a lot of I would have loved to give you more time, but because of my health, it is difficult to come again and also to go into more detail, so it will be very brief. But my stay here, I was engaged in a number of things. First, my own personal research and writing. And Alhamdulillah, during those 10 years, I was able to produce five books and over 50 articles. The Islamic Foundation was started from scratch. We had no place. So, Brother Majid and myself, we had a hosiery factory in Leicester, Mac Netware. On the first floor, we had one room. So that one room to be made available for the Islamic Foundation. And with the other, Banazir Hassan as one full time and a part time secretary, we started our work. With a budget of 3,000 pounds annually, donated by some of the trustees. And Alhamdulillah, by 1978, when I left it by the Khurram, took over, the Islamic Foundation has attained its distinct character as a key institution for <coughs> research, education, and dawah. Also with an outreach to help other Islamic organizations to fulfill their objectives according to their own plan, or to support them. And in that context, whatever service could be rendered towards Pakistan's Solidarity Front, which was important to politically at that time, UK Islamic Mission, Impact, Young Muslims, Muslim Education Trust, coordination with 
jamaa related organizations and coordination between movement oriented organizations in uk then islamic organizations in europe teaching them helping them and coordinating their activities also building contacts with america and other islamic organizations and back home with pakistan and keep contact that had been the framework in which i had to work as to inter interfaith dialogue we realized that this was something missing from our work. so first initiatives were taken during that period they were taken at three levels uk europe and the global area at the uk level we were participating in the interfaith meetings we joined hand with the seriok we had a joint conference was held as a result of which the center for study of christianity in islam came into existence the standing conference for jews and christians in muslim jordan was something that was already there we had a foothold in that in 1984 i was elected its uh, president a uh, vice president i participated in over a dozen of their conferences in europe particularly in germany in holland in france at the global level with vatican we came into contact and they invited me to give a series of six lectures in vatican institute for difficult we were invited in the tripoli in rome dialogues and then the high water mark in my view was the joint consultation sponsored by Islamic Foundation and World Congress of Churches known as Shambesi <coughs> consultation in 1986 on Islamic Dawa and Christian Mission and for the first time top level Muslim and Christian thinkers they met together they discussed the Islamic vision was expounded <coughs> and their journal international review of missions one full issue was devoted under my and David Kerr joint editorship to the proceedings of this conference, which has also been published separately <coughs> in book form. <coughs> and the important point is that in the joint communique, which was unanimous, <coughs> it was agreed by these leading Christian thinkers that Christian mission has by and large <coughs> misused education, aid, development for proselytizing purposes. <coughs> We regret that. They agreed that Muslims have a right to have their laws wherever they are in majority because <coughs> objecting on Islam, Muslims having Islamic laws in their own lands is going beyond tolerance. So I think that was a very important contribution, and Alhamdulillah, these things have continued ever since. And in the foundation, we established an interfaith unit for the first time in the Muslim world. A facility was created where we were collecting all Christian mystery activities, their books, their magazines, preparing reports on their work, and informing the Muslim Ummah as to what they are doing in our homelands. Next, we realized that coordination with Islamic organization in Europe and also presentation of Islam in Europe at a level where we can have dialogue with the intellectual and the political leaderships of these countries. It was with that idea that in 1973. a conference of all major islamic organizations and institutions in europe was organized in london under the auspices of organization of islamic conference and the secretary general of the conference at that time took over rahman was the sponsor of that it was in that conference that islamic council of europe was formed on the basis of the paper that i produced as the major paper for that and oic 
accepted the Islamic Council of Europe as one of its associate members, a position it enjoys up to now. Then you see we planned a series of conferences to project the Islamic message. And for that purpose, the Festival of Islam was being organized by Christians. We stepped into it and took over the international conference. So 1976 International Conference on Islam was the first major breakthrough where Islamic message was presented by leaders of Islamic movements from all the world. And that's how we tried to open up a dialogue with the intellectual, cultural, and political leadership of this country. That was followed by a dozen other conferences, seminars, dialogues, and <coughs> we also tried to produce a new literature. For that, we thought that these conferences should end with the declaration. So we produced first declaration of Islam, second international Islamic Declaration on Human Rights, prepared by us, but that was declared in an international conference in UNESCO in Paris, a modern Islamic constitution, the economic situation of the Muslim world and petrodollar and their utilization, misutilization. Over half a dozen international conferences were held. Books based on those conferences were produced. All this work was done. Basically by, in the name of Islamic Council of Europe, but by the foundation and the team that we had. It's unfortunate that Islamic Council of Europe later on could not continue. Now it's more even. And it's a platform, I think, that deserves to be revived. I very much feel the need of that. But Islamic Foundation, in fact, Islamic Council of Europe and interfaith dialogue had been the four major things that we did here. Plus, of course, work in Africa, in America, and other European <coughs> countries, all of that. Okay, our, because of the shortage of time, we will reduce the number of questions. So we'll take just two more questions. And the next question is by Brother Zahid Ali. He's got an economics degree from Cambridge University, a his kid. Uh, he's working in London as a fund funding manager at, for Merrill Lynch. Merrill Lynch. Father's name is Haji Muhammad Ali. He's a UK Islamic mission member from World Bank. Right. So, um, Professor, you have been referred to as the father of Islamic economics. Could you explain to us what Islamic economics means and also what some of the international Islamic economic bodies are doing and uh, what their uh, involvement is in the implementation of Islamic economics. I would have loved to talk on this subject in more detail, but now my own stamina is not with me and time is too much, uh, we have taken too much time already, so I'll be very, very brief. Let me put it like this. Islamic economics is not something new. Alhamdulillah, from the Medina state, Islamic economics and Islamic economic policies have been a part of our tradition. If you look into Muslim fiqh, you will not find a chapter of Islamic economics, but all the major issues we discuss in Islamic economics have been discussed in different places including classes of price determination, of role of state, role of the individual, <laughs> concept of profit, concept of wages, relationship between labor and uh, capital. All these issues have been discussed, <coughs> but not in that form. So what happened was that when the colonial rule overtook the Muslim world, and Islam somehow, unfortunately, became politically and intellectually eclipsed. It was during that period that Muslim thinkers and reformers, they tried to reassert Islamic thought. Shah Waliullah has done it in the 18th century. Then in the 20th century, Maulana Madhuji, Sayyid Khutub, Tarekhani, 
Baka Sadr, and dozens of other writers who were ulama, reformers, Muslim thinkers, they tried to present economic teachings of Islam, what Islam has to say on major economic issues. They developed a critique of capitalism, communism, socialism, fascism, syndicalism, and also they tried to present Islam as an alternate system of life. Its political system, its educational system, its legal system, its social system, and also its economic system. This was what these founding fathers had done. Now we, as professional economists, we realized that we have to now make a transition from economic teachings of Islam towards a discipline that could be called Islamic economics. The central idea is that how to define economic problem, what is the real economic issue, and how Islam tackles those economic issues. So examining the nature and significance and consequences of economic problems from the perspective of Islam in a manner that we can have, on the one hand, a body of knowledge that could give those laws, those rules, those norms, those principles which can be described as Islamic economics, and also from which economic policies could be derived. So, systematization and transition from economic teachings to economic discipline of economics. That is the transition that we have tried to make in the last 30 years. My first effort in that direction was, of course, when I was teaching in Karachi University. I wrote a series of articles published in different magazines and uh, newspapers. And then that was the first effort when at the master's level, we introduced in 1960s a full 100 mark paper on Islamic economics. First university that did it. Then Punjab University followed suit. Then we organized in 1976 the first international conference on Islamic economics with the cooperation of the King of the Rajiv University, Janta. Dr. Omar Zabair was the president of that conference. I was his vice president. And Dr. Sabaudi Zain, professor of uh, Turkey, Istanbul University, was his second vice president. That was the first occasion when 300 professional economists and ulama from all over the world participated in a conference and tried to present Islamic economics in a language mm -hmm. that could be looked upon as economics and not just theology or fiqh. This is the they to make. From then up till now, we have produced alhamdulillah, dozens of books, <coughs> conferences, seminars. We have also tried to introduce it at teaching levels. Now at least there are two universities in the world which have full master's program in Islamic economics, where economics and Islamic economics both are taught <coughs> and are integrated. <coughs> and some 48 universities where Islamic economics is being taught in some form as part of the university teaching program. Rice University in America has now created first chair in Islamic economics, where I was only last month. First conference of theirs was held and I gave the keynote address on Islamic banking. And Lakhbara University has introduced one paper in their master's program in comparative international banking on Islamic banking and finance. Similarly, many other universities. Third was operational. So simultaneously we were trying to develop new institutions which could experiment and move towards the implementation of these policies. Islamic Development Bank was established in 1975. I was one of the advisors which made the program. I was chairman of the first five-year plan committee. <coughs> and then again, next five years, the review committee. Then <coughs> first Professional bank, Dubai Bank, came in 1975. And now there are about over 200 banks. 
operating on these principles. <clears throat> when I was in government in Pakistan, we tried to develop a whole model of a complete economy, not very banking, or Islamic foundations. <clears throat> and our target was not just to establish one or two Islamic banks, but to eliminate Riba from all aspects of the economy, whether it is in common functions <clears throat> or private banking or private financial intermediation, that has been the effort. And now, Alhamdulillah, in the field of insurance, in the field of Muzaribah, in the field of leasing, in the field of mutual finance, in all these areas, practical efforts are being made. So, Islamic economics has these three dimensions. First, <coughs> formulation and development of a new academic discipline which looks upon the whole economic problem from Islamic perspective, reformulates the problem, and spells out those principles, modalities, on which an Islamic economic system would work, both at the micro and macro level. <coughs> Secondly, to develop practical institutions and help them how to practice Islamic economics through different institutions, not merely banks, but banking, insurance, business, in every field. And third, how to develop the model of an economy, not merely institutions, the whole metro framework, economic planning, its objectives, how to enable a modern state to develop its economic policies on Islamic foundations. So these have been three areas in which we have tried to make contribution. And Alhamdulillah, this is being acknowledged as one of the major development areas during the last 30 years. Now, I'm going to ask Brother Flak to give us the final question. Brother Flak uh, works for Islamic Relief, and he's also the Amir of Young Muslims. Is he, is he here? Assalamu alaikum. Professor, I wonder if you could, uh, uh, is there any particular mess personal message that you would like to give to the audience today regarding Islamic work in the West? A personal message. Yes, it's very important. It should be the, finally, of this presentation. And I do not believe, for a Muslim, East or West, or North or South, to present some independent kinds. Prophet we believe in is Rahmatullah. Whether we are in the West or the East, issue is the same, challenge is the same, and way out is the same. So first of all, we should be very clear. There is nothing like Islam for the West or Islam for the East. Islam is the same message, and for whole universe, for all people. The model is the same. But definitely, West is important today. Because the intellectual, scientific, technological, military, political, economic leadership is in their hands. And Islam has come to change the world. Not create some safe heavens here and there <coughs> and be content with them. The verses that were recited in the Holy Prayer are very clear. This religion has been sent the youth Dine Haq. Hidayah is not merely for individual life and not for, merely for the limited Middle Eastern countries. It's for every part, for the humanity. Whole world is the world of Dawah, the Maidan of Dawah. And this Dawah has some dimensions. First is we have to have the correct vision. Of Islam. Islam is not really for mosque. 
mosque is the center for the whole society. We have to accept Islam in its fullness. Ya yuraj ramanu, us kur fisil me kafir. Wala atat guru tapasha. This vision has to be given. This is the model of the Prophet. The Prophet was not merely a spiritual leader, a saint, in the limited sense of the word. <coughs> His leadership has to be expect, accepted in all walks of life. He is the authority in respect of all activities. And that's why his model covers personal piety, public morality, social policy, individual character, family, society, law, economy, international relations, dava, war, peace, all these dimensions are covered. So vision has to be taken. Secondly, in the light of this vision, our ultimate objective has to be very clear. It may take months, years, ages, centuries, it is immaterial. The real thing is our destination, our goals, our objective should be very clear. No compromise on that. But then we have to develop a realistic strategy. Allah's Prophet has given us not only Quran, Tanimul Kitab, Taskiya, purification, but also Hikma. And Hikma means how to apply this Hidayah, this message to our times, to our lives, to our situation. So it's not just a blind exercise of transplanting things from different parts. It's a creative effort, creative, which is relevant to the situation in which we are. So the second thing that I would say along the vision is we have to be creative, not imitative in Islamic Dawa. <coughs> it's the strategies, it's the institutions. Objective is the same, but it must be relevant to our situation. And as I see, here our target should be first to produce a good Muslim human being, man and woman, boy and girl, al-fard al-Muslim. If we ignore the fard al-Muslim, talk only globally, we will be nowhere. The Prophet has built Islamic community brick by brick. Every brick is important. Every brick is then so al further Muslim has to be what I trust. Then Muslim family. Usra Muslim. Family is the cradle of civilization. Family is the most important institution, the only divinely created institution. It has to be recreated in the true Islamic spirit not on the model of our customs, patriarchal or matriarchal, <coughs> feminism or new feminism, all of them are irrelevant. The model that the process has given is one of Rama, of love and affection, of Shura, of participation. Yes, there are division and responsibilities, roles, not of making women secondary, irrelevant, non-participatory. So we have to recreate that Muslim Muslim family. Third is education. Education is the key for the future. Education starts, as I said, with the lack of the mother, but then it is followed up by institutions. And the real challenge that the Dawa faces in West is how to create new Islamic institutions. We have to move ahead from the family to create institutions in the society. 
for education, for help and khidmat, for communication and drama, for economy, for building self-reliance among the Muslims, for enabling them to acquire knowledge, because leadership in the world is always in the hands of those who lead in thought. Who lead in technology, which is based on thought. So thought, technology, a state of preparedness, and it's not merely in the terms of some known quantities. It is in, the, in reference to the challenges that are coming from the society. Quran does not say merely of sabr. It says of musabr. Musabr is competitive. That is, that capacity of perseverance and steadfastness, which is capable of facing the challenges that are coming from adversaries in the Musabra. So creation of these institutions, leading to the emergence of a Muslim community, Muslim community with an identity, Muslim community which has roots in this part of the world, Muslim community which is not just a club of immigrants, a community that belongs to this soil. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have always addressed to the people, Yaqul. They have launched a movement within them. With that stock, with that raw material, with that manpower, they have built a movement, a society. <coughs> and then that society becomes the example. Which changes history. Why is it that 13 years of Makkah life produced some five to six hundred Muslims? Ten years of Madina body transform whole area. Within ten years, the entire Arabian Peninsula was in the current Islam. And the Prophet addressed his last one was Raj. Over a hundred thousand people were there. At that age, at that time, within the Khulafa Rashidun, the forty years, Islam was there in all the three continents. No. Within hundred years, Islam was a superpower. So it's with the body. So the sequence is for the Muslim, Osra Muslim, al Mustafa Muslim, with institutions, with the model, and then with Dola The global mission. Belong with the Islamic Ummah wherever we are, and to see how we can contribute towards the full flowering of this Ummah. So there is no shortcut. The path is the same, but we have to develop strategies, we have to prepare human beings, and the most important critical resource is not money. Are human beings. So if that we are prepared to offer, I assure you, inshallah, Islam would be, is destined to be the future. Um, respected elders, brothers and sisters, um, there are many more questions and I'm sure a lot of our elders have, uh, they have also have many questions. Time is very short, so we'll have to finish here. I would just like on behalf of everyone to thank uh, Professor Kushida for coming and giving his time. Can I just say that uh, throughout our young Muslims and ISV period, two people have been a great source of guidance and inspiration for us, Brother Khurum Murad, may Allah uh, bless his soul, and Professor Kushida Ahmed. 
I've never had a problem. If I had any problem, any question, I could have direct access to him. We have been to Professor Bashir's house many times, and I've sometimes spent about two hours there. Very inspiring, very motivating. And whenever we had some problems, he was the best fight for us. May Allah reward him for all the things he has done. And may Allah give him a long life so that he can contribute to more and more for his levels. I found this very valuable, inspiring and educational, and I'm sure everyone here has. Um, he has to go back because tomorrow he has to come back again. I have that in mind as well. There's a UK Islamic Mission conference tomorrow. And on behalf of UK Islamic Mission, if I can invite everyone to come to that conference, and Professor Kushida Ahmed and some of the leading Islamic movement leaders from the Indian subcontinent will be there. So I encourage everyone to come to that program. Again, I thank Professor Kushida Ahmed, and now I hand it over to... Simon Venue. Simon Venue. Central Mosque, Birmingham Central Mosque, uh, Birmingham Central Mosque uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock it starts. 10 o'clock. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I just want to, I'm going to keep it brief because I know we've all been up there to pray and we smell the food so it's uh, too, too late to actually eat the Bronx PT. I just wanted to mention a couple of things that ISP are involved in over the next few weeks. The first is Islam Awareness Week. Um, when I first came into the movement about a, or just over a year ago, um, I realised that we were spending a lot of our time looking inwards and we, we have this tendency among Muslims that we worry about ourselves. Islam Awareness Week was... Um, <laughs> the exception to this rule, it, it made us look outwards, we, you know, when you, when you actually go out there and do mm -hmm. dawah in the middle of the town centre and so on, you realise there's a great hunger uh, for, of, for the, uh, the local people for Islam. And I think this is, this, although it's been a great success, it's been something which um, has not lived up to expect, expectations. It was meant to be something which brought people in from all, all kinds of uh, lifestyles and into uh, sort of one <coughs> movement, basically, just for that one week, inshallah. I mean, we are trying to work closer with mission and inshallah we'll have to also, and we should look at this as uh, maybe a beginning where we can actually just try and, uh, try and pull together. Um, the second thing I'd like to mention is just the forum magazine which ISP Birmingham produced. Uh, we do need your support inshallah, so uh, mainly at the moment it's running on adverts, but inshallah uh, we're trying to get subscriptions uh, to keep it going. Um, the other thing that the, the forum is doing at the moment is, um, is tackling this uh, issue of uh, promotional homosexuality in schools. If you, if you uh, may have heard in the news that the Labour government is thinking of uh, repealing Section 28, which the gay lobby wants to repeal, which at the moment prevents them from promoting homosexuality, and they will then be able to promote homosexuality from prim primary schools onwards as a normal, normal thing. Um, in, the, in the magazine itself, there, there are um, petitions, which inshallah, even if you get your families to sign, and send them to us, and also inshallah, we'll be going around the mosque and trying to get petitions from them. Zakalah <laughs> ربنا لا تواخذنا من نسينا وحتى ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إحسان ولا تقوله ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا تقدر ورحمنا فنصنا 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 الله منا نصر ما صار دون النبي ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعذك if everyone can make their way to the dinner board and let's meet each other, socialize, and you can ask Professor Kushida a question. Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to fix my brother next